If you will, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6. This is a reminder of our study of spiritual warfare. Finally, my brother, picking up in verse 10, be strong in the Lord and the might of his power. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Well, we've been looking at our, for several months now, the this important study of spiritual warfare. Paul makes it very clear that there is a warfare going on, uh, that all Christians will be engaged in it. And so as Christians, we don't have the option to compromise on the battlefield. As Christians, we don't have the option to retreat. We must engage, but how we engage is important. I hope you've been seeing this as we've gone uh, through this study. Uh, you know, you look at the, you know, we've been looking at this passage here, just kind of been planning here on verse 13, because there is an evil day uh, that we have been called to stand in. And that evil day, I think he's separating that from the fact that, yes, we're living in a sin cursed world, but there are some days that are just more particularly uh, challenging than others. And it's interesting, those challenges come in different forms, don't they? Uh, some some of you may have experienced health afflictions. Satan can use that to come against you. And how you respond to those health afflictions matter. Maybe you know someone who is going through a difficult time, a trial, uh, through some kind of health issue. Well, you know there's an attack coming after them. And so we need to come along beside them to encourage them how to respond to that situation. I mean, I think about some of these pastors out in California that are dealing with an oppressive government. That's an evil day. But pay attention to those men who are coming in under attack. How do they respond? Notice they're not retreating. They're not compromising. But they're not repaying evil for evil. They're not sl- and notice the slanders being brought against their churches and because they're meeting. They're being slandered that they're doing all kinds of crazy things. But the response is not evil for evil. Notice how they respond. But they are fighting. There is a spiritual warfare going on there. We see spiritual warfare with our own sin and how we respond to that. We can't just say... Well, I'm a champion for all your sins, and I'm going to go and help you with your sin, but ignore my own. There's battlefronts everywhere we go. And every battlefield is different. Every battlefield does not require the same strategy, but it does require strategy. And I think this is where most Christians fail. They just wake up, wander into this evil day, and then start reacting without a battle plan, without a strategy. And so this is what Paul's trying to get us to understand when he says... Take the whole armor of God. You put it on. You never take it off, right? You put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil day. And you are expected, I am expected to stand. Well, we looked at this uh, over the last several weeks. How do we stand in this evil day? We need to have a relationship, a covenant relationship with Christ. We also need to resist the loving of the things of this world. And then the one we've been really focusing on is we've got to resist the works of the flesh, reacting out out of the flesh, because that will sideline us quicker than anything. And so, go back over to Galatians 5. We've been looking at Galatians 5 for quite some time, looking at the contrasting the works of the flesh with the fruit of the Spirit. And so, we've looked at the fruit of love. We've looked at the fruit of joy and peace and patience. And this morning, notice here in verse 22, he says, But the fruit of the, of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness. And then this morning, I want to talk about faithfulness. So let's look at this particular fruit. The fruit of faith is impossible to demonstrate. Here's the thing I want us to make sure we grasp. It is impossible to demonstrate if we're only concerned about ourselves. We cannot have the fruit of faithfulness if we're only concerned about ourselves. Now why is that? Why is it not possible for a selfish person to be faithful? Well, a faithful person is one who's committed to principles, right? Can't we agree that a faithful person is one who's committed to principles? And if you're committed to a principle, then you do the right thing even if it hurts you, even if it costs you. 
So when you meet someone who is not committed to principles, they're not going to be faithful. They're not going to be faithful. This insight, I think, is important because when we're confronted with some kind of moral dilemma, we never, if we're going to be faithful Christians, we never respond by saying, how will this outcome of my decision to this moral dilemma, how is it going to impact me? If I'm faithful, I don't think like that. The first question I always have to ask when I'm confronted with a moral dilemma is this, what's right? What's godly? Many times we don't start there, do we? We normally start off with, well, what's in my best interest? How's this going to serve me? But in order to be faithful, we always have to start with, what is right at this moment? What is godly? What is Christ-like? Now, I think there's some insights here that need to be fleshed out a little bit further. And so if you're like me, um, it's frustrating when you, when you meet people who claim to be Christians, but they don't behave this way. They don't live according to any principles. They act according to their own self-interest. So the insight we need to have about this issue is that we need to understand. Let's not be naive about this. There are some people who appear to do the right thing, but they're only doing the right thing because it was in their interest to do the right thing at the moment. And so here's what happens. When these people do something that makes you scratch your head, it makes you wonder, why did they change? They seem to be doing things not which is right, but things that are only in their self-interest. Well, it could very well have been they didn't change. They're still acting in their own interest. The problem is, is that their own interests do not align with what is right at the moment, and now it's fleshing itself out. They are still following the principles of thinking of themselves first, and now it just happens to manifest itself in an overtly sinful way. Now, what's the caution and the warning for us? That could be us, right? That could be us, couldn't it? Are you doing what you're doing because it's right? Or is what you're doing, it appears to be right, but you're only doing it because it serves you in your own interest, your own personal interest? How do we think about an issue? What motivates us? What is right? What benefits me? H how are you going to make those distinctions as a Christian? You see, if you don't work through this, then you know what? You could be the next family. You could be the next person that makes the other scratch their head and say, what happened to you? In order for the fruit of faithfulness to flourish, then we must be committed to principles, not self-interest. I mean, we just read that in uh, Philippians 2, didn't we? And our faithfulness must flow from faith in God. It has to. You see, if we have a trust and faith in God, then that brings a sense of steadfastness, a sense of stability within our lives. Faithfulness will never flourish if I don't first have trust and faith in God. So if I'm to have a steadfast, a stable character, if I'm to be seen as dependable, then we must have a trust in God. We have all met these people who just you cannot depend upon them. Right? You don't even ask them to do anything because, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end up having to do it anyway. But when people ask you to do things, do they ask you because, you know what, your character is such, you're steadfast, you're dependable, you do what you say you're going to do, even if it's to your own hurt. But if you're going to have that kind of character, then we must have trust in God. The kind of stability does not come from our circumstances because our circumstances is always changing, right? If we're to be faithful and seen as faithful, then those around us must expect us to keep our word no matter what our circumstances are. In other words, my faithfulness cannot be tied to whether or not I'm having a good day or not. Fathers, is that how your children see you? You do what you say you're going to do. But they don't look at you and say, yeah, he'll do what he says he's going to do unless he's having a bad day. See, that's what it means to be steadfast, to be dependable, stable. A person that truly believes God is in control of everything does not make decisions based on the circumstances or what it may cost him. The person that trusts God will always choose to do what is right. Now, just like with all the other fruits, let's talk about the weed. What's the weed that stands in opposition to the fruit of faithfulness? Well, I mean, there's a lot of ways to describe it, but let's call it you're just undependable, you're unfaithful. And according to the scriptures, this is always seen as disobedience. Uh, turn over to Hebrews 3. Hebrews 3. Hebrews 3. Notice this here in verse 19. Hebrews 3, 19. So we see that they could not enter in because of, notice, unbelief. In other words, 
The children of Israel, the writer of Hebrews, is pointing back to that first generation who did not enter into the land because they didn't have faith. They did not believe. They were faithless people. So because they were without faith, they're unfaithful. They're not trustworthy. Now look at verse 6 in chapter 4. Talking about the same event. Notice how he describes it here. Since therefore it remains that some must enter in it, and that those to whom it was first preached did not enter in because of disobedience. Well, which one is it? Did they not enter in because they didn't have faith, or did they not enter in because they were disobedient? It was both. These are just two different ways to describe the same thing. A person that is undependable, faithless, is a dis disobedient person. Another thing, a faithless person does not keep their word. I mean, think about our politicians, right? We just expect them, we've just become accustomed to them not keeping their promises, their word, right? But it's not just the politician that doesn't keep his word. I mean, we live in just a dishonest age. And that dishonesty has infiltrated the church. Think about people who are willing to break the rules when they think no one is looking, right? Think about the person who is loose with the tax code if they think they can get away with it, right? Think about how people are, are not faithful in their friendships or those who are unfaithful in their marriages. This is a real problem within this land. We are seen as an unfaithful, dishonest generation. So we live in a very dishonest age when you cannot count on people. Have you ever asked yourself, have you ever wondered why there are just so many codes and regulations out there? It's because we're a dishonest people. We can't trust people just to do what's right. Think about the number of regulations. Is, is the number of regulations that are out there are just an indictment against this culture because they're a reminder that we need the government to oversee almost every area of life just to ensure that we're going to deal honestly with each other. So we have the weed of unfaithfulness that stands in opposition to the fruit of faithfulness. Well, what's the artificial fruit? Well, there is a fake fruit faithfulness out there. It's just this what we might call a half-heartedness. And those who go through the outward motions of conformity to principles. But there's no real commitment there. Can you think of any categories of people who fit that? Children do. Children fit in this. Children are a good example of this. They'll go through the outward motions of conformity to the principles just to get mom and dad off their back. You've seen this with your children, I'm quite sure. So when mom and dad are not around, Mom and dad's not paying attention. The formalism, the outward conformity just disappears. But adults are good at this too, right? We're very good at this. The artificial fruit is seen when there's no real commitment to principles and the consequences of, of putting on a front. And so why do, why do some people put, you know, uh, look like they're conforming to these principles? Well, they just don't want to be embarrassed or deal with the inconvenience of not putting on the front. But if you're not watching, you know, what is your behavior when no one's watching? What, what is your character like when no one's there? I want to think about the Pharisees because they put a lot of stock in outward appearance, didn't they? But the real test of faithfulness is, is when you're alone and you can get away with breaking principles, breaking God's principles, but you don't. That's the true test of faithfulness. So here's a question for us. If we could get away with something, do we? Think about work. Over the years, I've noticed this tendency when people are working for me, I can walk up to their, their cubicle or their desk and immediately they click the YouTube station down immediately. Now, when I wasn't there, they were trying to get away with it. Now, I've never made a rule that says you couldn't, can't do that. But it is interesting when you walk up on them, immediately shut it down. You see, when they thought I wasn't watching, they were doing something they thought I would disapprove of. The moment I step up, they close it down. That's just an hour conformity. That's not faithful. Okay. So what are we like when we're alone? And for those that are, who know us best, those that are closest to us, would they say the artificial fruit manifests itself more than the genuine fruit? Now here's the thing. Maybe some of you don't think that the artificial fruit is that big of a deal. God doesn't think much about it. You might think that, but you'd be wrong. Go to Malachi. Go to Malachi 2. Malachi 2, look at verse 1. And now, O priest, this commandment is for you. 
if you will not hear and if you will not take it to heart to give glory to my name, says the Lord, I will send a curse upon you. I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have cursed them already because you do not take it. And then he goes on to say in verse 3, Behold, I will rebuke your descendants. I will spread, I don't know how your translation reads this, I will spread refuse, some of yours may have dung, on your faces. The refuse or the dung of your solemn feast, and one will take you away with it. Now, this is the prophet's response to those priests who have this half-hearted commitment and approach to God. That's not a very pleasant verse to think about, is it? In fact, I've been in a lot of Christians' homes over the last 20-something years. I've never seen that verse stitched on a pillow or put on a frame and hung on the wall. But you know what? It is God's Word, isn't it? It's God's Word. It's God's attitude towards those who have this half-hearted commitment to Him. I think we all understand Malachi's not trying to be polite here, is he? He's trying to get a serious word across. His use of drastic language was to make a point to a rebellious people who were playing games with God. And I hope you hear me today. Don't play games with God. If your mind is already turning, I know exactly who you're talking about. Stop. Focus for a moment. Let's personalize this. Let's ask ourselves, is today just outward conformity to go through the motions of religion Or is today about the seriousness of worshiping God with all my heart, all my soul, all my strength? I do not want this indictment against myself. This is what God thinks about half-hearted worship, this artificial fruit of faithfulness. Those who were playing games with God back in Malachi's day, God says, I'm just going to spread dung on your face. This is what I think of your half-hearted approach of worshiping me. God hates fake outward conformity with no heart that desires Him, no heart that desires to serve Him. Hold that thought. Turn over to Matthew 23. Matthew 23. Uh, Look at verse 23. I mean, we could jump in here anywhere. But notice what he says. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you pay the tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inwardly they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside of them, that the outside of them may also be clean. What do you scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites? For you like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear to be beautiful outwardly, but inside full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. And even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men. Oh, but inside, you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. These were men that were not truly faithful towards God, were they? Right? The outward formal conformity to a principle, but there's just no inward love for God. There's no desire to do what's right. And this is disgusting to God. This is the kind of person that God would rather smear the dung on their face than allow them into his presence. And I want us to remind ourselves of this. Malachi is not speaking to atheists, is he? He's he's talking to a people. He's not talking to an agnostic age about people who say, well, I don't know whether there's a God or not. They all professed that God was one. They all knew Deuteronomy 6, didn't they? But he says, your your outward conformity with no inward reality makes me sick. In other words, he was talking here, if you look at this, he was talking to people who were robbing God with their tithes. They're not bringing their best to sacrifice. Remember, that was a real problem there in Malachi, wasn't it? He said, you're bringing your blemished animals here for my sacrifice. You're not bringing me your best. So, don't take the sin of this artificial fruit lightly, because God does not. God does not desire faithlessness in his people. Turn to Psalm 15. Psalm 15. Psalm 15, verse 1. Now here's a great question. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle and who may dwell in your holy hill? I mean, that's a great question that we ought to be asking ourselves. And and, and the psalmist gives us the answer, doesn't he? 
He who walks uprightly and works righteousness, he who speaks the truth in his heart, he who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but notice he honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. He who does not put out his money to, at usury, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does all these things shall never be moved. So who can live with God? In other words, who can be with in his presence? Well, there's a lot of answers here, but verse 4 teaches us one thing. Only the faithful can be in the presence of God. These are the kind of people who are driven by principle. They keep their word because they're driven by principle. They keep their word to their own hurt. And so by definition, if we're going to be a people of principle, then we're going to live according to those principles even when it inconveniences us, right? That's the kind of person that can dwell with God. Go to 2 Kings. Let me show you another example of faithfulness. 2 Kings. Uh, turn to 2 Kings 12. This is an interesting story. I, I'm just going to read a piece of it to drive on the point, but you can go back and read it later. In 2 Kings 12, look at verse 9. Then Jehoiada, uh, the priest, took the chest, bored a hole in its lid, and set it beside the altar on the right side as one comes into the house of the Lord. And the priest who kept the door there, all the money brought was into the or was brought into the house. So it was, whenever they saw that there was much money in the chest, that the king, scribe, and the high priest came up, put it in bags, and counted the money that was found in the house of the Lord. Then they gave the money which had been apportioned into the hands of those who did the work, who had the oversight of the house of the Lord. And they paid it out to the carpenters and the builders who worked on the house of the Lord, and to uh, masons and stone cutters for the buying of timber and, the hew and hewn stone to repair the damage of the house of the Lord and for all that was paid out to repair the temple. However, there were not made for the house of the Lord basins of silver, trimmers, sprinkling bowls, trumpets, and articles, uh, any articles of gold or articles of silver uh, from the money brought into the house of the Lord. But notice here, but they gave that to the workmen that they required, uh, that they repaired the house of the Lord with it. Moreover, notice here, they did not require an account of from the men whose hand they delivered the money to be paid to the workmen, for they dealt faithfully. That's interesting, isn't it? They didn't have to negotiate. They didn't have to worry about being paid because those distributing the funds were faithful. They didn't have to give an account for how the money was being spent. Why? These were just faithful men. Can you imagine doing work in our day without a contract? Give an account? Uh, when you do work for someone else, you have to give an account? Well, that's because we don't live in a faithful age anymore. But when you're dealing with faithful people, you don't have to have that kind of oversight. And that's what these men were like. In a Christian culture, people will keep their word. And as the people of God, we, sh you know, we shouldn't need a contract to force us to do what is right. And so, for example, if I say I'm going to pay someone, they should never have to come find me to get paid. Right? I should just honor my word. I mean, that's just what I should do as a Christian. But that's what these men were like. And so... Even though that's what a Christian society should look like, I realize we don't live in a Christian culture right now, but as Christians, we shine as lights in this dark culture. And one of the ways we can shine as light is just do what's right. Be faithful. It doesn't matter that everyone else in your trade, everyone else that, that in the same line of business you have, even if all of them are crooked and perverse, you, you stand as lights. Turn over to Philippians 2. We read this this morning, but make, I just want to make sure you picked up on something that was read. Philippians 2. Notice how Paul describes Timothy. Uh, Philippians 2, verse 19. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly that I may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father he served with me in the gospel. Therefore I hope to send him to uh, him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself may come shortly. Well, Paul's writing this from prison, so he can't come. So what does he do? He, he wants to send Timothy. And notice how Timothy is described here. I mean, what commendation we have here about this young man. This is the kind of testimony we want. Paul says, you know, there's others out there who serve, but ultimately they, they seek their own. That's not what we see with Timothy, though, right? He serves Christ. Timothy is held out to us as one who is faithful. The reason why he's faithful is because his Father in Heaven is faithful. Go to Psalm 89. This is a great psalm um, that just reminds us of the faithfulness of our Heavenly Father. Psalm 89. Just, I'll read some of it to you. It's a great, I might read out the whole thing, but just read it with me. Follow along. 
Psalm 89. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Your faithfulness you shall establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to my servant David. Your seed I will establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. And the heavens will praise your wonders, O Lord. Your faithfulness also in the assembly of the saints. For who in the heavens can be compared to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty will be likened to the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those around him. O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty like you, O Lord? Your faithfulness also surrounds you. You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you steal them. You have broken Rahab in pieces as one who is slain. You have scattered your enemies with a mighty arm. The heavens are yours. The earth is yours. The world is in all of its fullness you have founded them. The north and the south you have created them. Tabor and Hermon rejoice in your name. You have a mighty arm, strong as your hand, as high as your right hand. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. Blessed are the people who know, who make, who know the joyful sound. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. In your name they rejoice all day long. And in your righteousness they are exalted. For you are the glory of their strength and your favor our horn is exalted for our shield belongs to the Lord and our king is the Holy One of Israel. Well, what is God being praised for in this psalm? He's being praised for his might, his strength, but his faithfulness. And notice where his faithfulness is established. It's in the very heavens. In other words, his faithfulness extends to the very heavens. And the point of the psalm is that God is so reliable. Creation points to the stability of God day after day after day. The Bible wants us to understand that God is faithful. Even when he doesn't seem like he's there. Even when it seems like everything's going wrong around you, he is still faithful. Think about afflictions. God wants us to know he is there. God wants us to know that he is with us. And we are to emulate that faithfulness. As image bearers of God, we are to be seen as a faithful, stable, dependable people, despite what's going on around us. Go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119, look at verse 75. I know, O oh Lord, that your judgments are right and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Now read that one again. I know, O oh Lord, that your judgments are right and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Can you sing this? <coughs> can you pray this when you go through a difficult time? If you can, then it will only strengthen your faithfulness. It will only increase your faithfulness. It will only increase your stability in your walk. You see, if you can make it through a trial and you can focus on the faithfulness of God through that trial, it will only increase your faithfulness. That's important for us to grasp because faithfulness cannot be tied to my circumstance or what other people do or don't do. And that, that's a problem. We want to react and, and be unfaithful if other people react and, and are unfaithful. But that's not what we're being taught here. When I go through a difficulty, right, or when others let us down, I'm not going to be worried about how they treat me. I'm not going to worry about the consequences of anything because I'm a principled person. I want the fruit of faithfulness to flourish in my life despite the circumstances or despite what other people do. And as I apply the principles in my life, even if it costs me, even if it's an inconvenience to me, I'm going to trust God through that process. Isn't that how Christ lived his life? Isn't that how Christ applied his ministry? And this is how I have to think if I'm going if I desire the you know the fruit of faithfulness to grow in my life. You know what faithfulness also does? Turn over to uh, Proverbs 27. Proverbs 27. <clears throat> Proverbs 27. Verse 6 says this, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kiss of an enemy are deceitful. You see faithfulness allows us to take criticism and encouragement from our friends. When someone comes to us with a genuine desire to criticize, I know it wounds, right? A rebuke is always wounding. But the Proverbs are teaching us that that's the result of a faithful friend, right? An enemy can kiss up to you and tell you what you want to hear, but a friend who is faithful will tell you what you need to hear. Turn back over to Psalm 141. Psalm 141. Psalm 141, verse 5. Let the righteous strike me. It shall be a kindness. And let him rebuke me. It shall be an, as an excellent oil. Let my head not refuse it. You see, if I want to you know, be encouraged 
to be faithful, then I need to take the reproof like a blessing, like an oil upon my head. When the faithful are willing to reprove me, I should not look at it as a curse, but I should see it as a blessing. So I want us to think about this. Are we faithful friends if we allow one another to sin or live in, in a self-destructive kind of way? Would I be a faithful friend to you if I allowed that to happen? When you see someone that you consider a friend living in a compromising sort of way, do you just look the other way? And here's the thing I can tell you from experience. There are many people who do not want to hear from a faithful friend. And that kind of person, when you can't hear from a faithful friend, then you're basically saying, I do not want the fruit of faithfulness to grow in my life because that's exactly what the texts are telling us. Well, that's why God has put them there. God has put faithful friends in your life for a reason. And so we have a dilemma, don't we? You ever been a faithful friend to someone and, and pointed out something to them? And they lashed out at you, right? You've been burnt. You ever been burnt being a faithful friend? You bring the warning, the other person turns to you and despises you for it. When that happens, what's the temptation? What's the temptation when you go and you try to be the faithful friend to someone and you get burnt in the process? What's the temptation? Well, the temptation is to get gun shy and throw your hands up and say, you know what, I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to ever get involved in somebody's life. I'm going to distance myself from people. But isn't that the point? If we're going to be faithful, we must do what principles dictate, not what necessarily brings ease and comfort. What if you get burnt ten times in a row? What does principles dictate at that moment? If you want the fruit of faithfulness in your life, what does it dictate? You continue to apply your principles. If you desire to be a faithful friend, you must do the hard things at times. Okay? Now, we need to understand the seriousness of faithfulness. The Bible tells us, it's very clear, that without faith it is impossible to please God. Faith always implies faithfulness. A faith without works is a dead faith. It's useless and it does not save. Now let's go back. Are you starting to pull all these things together? Maybe you, you, you quit keeping score months ago. There's a reason why we're here. Do you remember why? <laughs> because all the way back to our study in Romans. In Romans we left off at the end of chapter 5 with this grand glorious doctrine of justification by faith. Right? We learned that the doctrine uh, we learned the doctrine of justification by faith, right? It's a grand and glorious doctrine, but that doctrine needs further fleshing out because the faith that justifies is a faith that produces faithfulness. And that's why we moved over to the book of Hebrews to look at what extent we should be faithful. Remember, Hebrews 11 teaches us the extent that we should be faithful. The author of Hebrews teaches us the just, those who have been justified by faith, will live by their faith. And so Hebrews 11 gives you all these Old Testament examples of faithful saints. So if the just shall live by faith, that's kind of abstract, isn't it? Well, to what extent? Well, the writer says, I'm glad you asked. I'm going to give you a whole chapter of people who demonstrate how they live by their faith. We see how the just ones live. The just ones are a faithful people. The Bible is clear on this point. Uh, one of the greatest chapters to flesh this out, I think, is found over in James 2. So go back over there. Go back to James 2 because in that chapter we learn that a faithless faith is useless. It is dead. Let me just read this to you and I want to, I want to point out a few things for you. James 2, look at uh, verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warm and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for uh, the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God? Well, you do well. But don't pat yourself on the back because he says even the demons believe and tremble. But, you, but do you want to know, O foolish man, that with faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that his faith was working together with his works? And by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. 
And likewise was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Well, notice how it starts off in verse 14. There's this whole section. Is, 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 it starts off with a complaint, right? He starts, what does it profit my brethren if someone says he has faith but does not have works? So he starts off with this question. There are two primary questions that, that are being asked here. What does it profit and what good does it do? It's not only raised here, but it is raised again in verse 16, right? He says, and one of you says, depart in peace, be warned, be filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed uh, for the body. What does it profit? So we ask it again. So what good does it do, my brothers? Now here's the claim. If a certain one should say that he has faith, now that's the positive claim in verse 14. Uh, one translates it for anyone who professed to have faith. If one claims to have faith, if a man claims to have faith, that's the thrust of the claim, uh, of, of the statement here. So when I come to this verse, I see that someone's making a profession of faith, right? The person is claiming to have uh, faith in Jesus, and he's making that profession. The person is claiming to be a religious person. He appears to be a religious person based on what he says. The individual claims to have faith in Christ. The individual claims to be a very religious person. So you see the issue. So notice James is not saying the man has faith. That's critical here. He's not saying the man actually has faith. He's just simply saying there's a man who claims to have faith. And a positive claim is made, but immediately he throws in the negative fact. And look at it. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says, someone claims he has faith, now here's the negative side, but does not have works? Notice the contract, contrast here. He says one thing, but his actions, the way he lives, demonstrates he does not have works. And we all understand the situation here. You have an individual, he professes to have faith, but there's no corresponding works to substantiate the claim. So this is a person who professes faith, but has no corresponding fruit, right? Now the works that James is referring to is not some kind of legalistic attempt to merit salvation. Rather, James is referring to works of faith. So to me, it's obvious what James is doing here. He's attacking a verbal profession of faith that produces no change in the person's conduct. He is condemning a mere profession that's divorced from practice. He's condemning words that have no works. He's condemning belief that does not demonstrate itself in behavior. He's condemning rhetoric that has no meaningful reality behind it. He's pointing out an inoperative faith that is destitute of works. Now that's what James is doing. And then he asks the question, what profit is it, my brothers, if there's one who says he has faith but does not have works? And then he's going to ask, ask this follow-up question. You see what he says there? Can that kind of faith save? See what he's doing? What does he mean by that kind of faith? What's well, the kind of faith that does not produce work? And notice, this is not some academic exercise. This is not some kind of academically or some kind of emotional question. This has everything to do with salvation. So it's very practical. What kind of faith is he talking about here? Well, he's talking about a kind of faith that never demonstrates practical works. This is a faith that makes a profession, but this faith is not represented by any kind of works whatsoever. Uh, he, then he asks this question, and this is why it's important. He says, can that kind of faith save him? And the way he asked this question in the Greek demands a no answer. It's just the way he wrote it in Greek. And so when I read this, I understand that true faith can save, but this faith in word only has no cor that has no corresponding work. Or you, or you might think there's just no fruit, right? He's saying that cannot save. Now, this kind of verse, this kind of teaching here should be sobering to all of us, right? If we don't have a mere profession of faith, but there's no true love for Christ, there's no true love for his people, there's no true love for his commands, then we should be concerned. If we just made a profession of faith, but there's no fruit within our lives. And so this verse deals with salvation and the nature of true saving faith. Now, kids, let me just caution you right here. Some of you, because if you're like me, your mind starts wondering, I don't know if I have enough fruit. You, you're missing the point. <clears throat> there are going to be some people with 30-fold, some with 60, and some with 100. The question is not do you have enough fruit. The question is do you have any fruit. That make sense? And, and when you made a profession of faith day one, do you expect all the fruit to be right? That's the work of the gospel, right? The work of the gospel and the reading of the word and the spirit working within your life. And as the spirit prunes these things off of you, takes these old works of the flesh off and out of your life, it's going to be replaced. The pruning process can be painful at times, right? It's not something that's enjoyable. 
But as those things, those flesh works are pruned out, it makes way for the fruit of the Spirit to take place in your life and to flourish. Be careful you, you don't take this to a conclusion I'm not wanting you to take it to. But I do want you to understand that a faith with no corresponding works. In other words, you are just going through the academic exercise of mouthing and spitting back answers to questions and you know that there's God, but there's no corresponding desire within your life. That, that's what's challenging. That's what's challenging. So Mark Lloyd-Jones comes to this and says, James was dealing with these kind of people who said, I have faith, I'm a believer, and then went on to say because they had faith and were believers, it didn't matter what they did. That's what we got to be careful of. That's what we need to be watching out for. Jones goes on to write, they had the problem of easy believism in the church. James is dealing with men who only claim to have faith. They use the word faith, but they only meant an intellectual assent. So you see what James is dealing with? One said it this way, it must be noted that a discussion is about a person who only asserts that he has faith. This person has no real faith, and hence his faith does not find expression in deeds. The author does not take issue with faith, but superficial conception of it, which permits faith to be only a formal <coughs> concession, a Christianity of mere words that does not lead to salvation. Another writes, The clue to understanding this section is the fact, very often ignored in verse 14, that the author has not said, If a man has faith, but if a man says he has faith, this fact should control our interpretation of the whole paragraph. The burden of this section, as often, uh, is supposed that we are not saved through faith plus works, but through a genuine as opposed to a counterfeit faith. Does that make sense? We're not saved based upon faith plus work. We're saved by faith alone and Christ alone through God's grace alone to his glory alone. But that faith will be corresponded with fruit. Does that make sense? A declaration, one says, of faith that does not result in a changed life and good works is a false declaration. Another man writes, if a man makes a declaration of faith in Christ but his life remains absolutely unchanged, then that man has every reason to question the reality of his faith. Spurgeon says it this way, faith and obedience are bound up in the same bundle. He that is without faith is without works, and he that is without works is without faith. That's what I think James is trying to teach us here. He's attacking a verbal abuse of faith that produces no change in a person. A.T. Robertson put it this way. It is the spurious claim of faith that James is condemning. So I've got to understand verse 14 if I'm going to interpret the rest of this section. But notice what he says. The emphasis is on saved. This kind of faith will not save. Now when it comes to this text, James is not saying half works and half faith will save someone. Right? He's not saying that faith plus works saves someone. He's contrasting a true faith with a claimed faith. A true faith saves, but a claimed faith does not. That's what he's talking about. So James is pointing out the inconsistency of what one claims to be and what one really is. And, and we see this all the time. I mean, we can see examples from history. Maybe you've got relatives like this. They say one thing, but their lives manifest something completely different than what they profess. Let me just give you, a historian Paul Johnson points this out. If you go back and look at the writer Russo, who was an intellectual, he repeatedly, repeatedly proclaimed to be the friend of all mankind. He said he was born to love. He once said of himself, whoever examines with his own eyes my nature, my character, my morals, inclination, pleasures, habits, and believe me to be a dishonest man is a man who deserves to be strangled. Now, it's one thing to make those claims, isn't it? A friend, to be a friend of all mankind, a man who is born to love. It's one thing to say that, isn't it? But then you go back and you look at his life. What does his life testify? Well, his father meant nothing to him but an inheritance. His only concern for his brother was to certify him dead so that he could get the money. He did not claim any of his five children after, the, after they were born. He left them in the hospital where it's believed they all died. So he can make all the claims he wants to, but look at his life. And the claim was very different than what reality says about it. And that's what James is talking about here. What if a man says, that's his claim, says he has faith, but he has no works. That's his reality. Will that kind of faith say? And James says no. Now, what James does is he takes this abstract principle in verse 14, and he makes it very concrete in verse 15 and 16. All right, Because he's going to give you some down-to-earth concrete illustrations. Look what he does there. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to him, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Now that word translated doesn't necessarily mean without, you know, be totally naked. It just simply means insufficient clothing. So if you look this word up in a, a Greek lexicon, for example, uh, it, it would just say without an outer garment, which would, you know, without, you know, uh, 
a decent person wouldn't show up without that hour garment on back in those days. So you're dealing with someone who is just insufficiently dressed, right? So maybe they don't have the outward garment, but uh, only the inward garment. And some of the translations would take this word to be rags. But if a brother or sister is in rags, lacking daily food, we, we think, you know, just don't have what the daily provisions are. Do you see what we're talking about here? Brother or sisters, they're in rags, they're starving. Now we're thinking about somebody who's cold and hungry. I mean, that would be extreme destitution, right? This is no mild situation. It's very desperate. This is a need that is urgent because the person is shivering. He's cold or she's cold and they're very hungry. Now, how would you expect a true believer to respond in that situation? Right? Well, notice the kind of person James describes. He says in verse 16, And one of you who says you have faith, and one of you says, Depart in peace, be warm and filled, but... You do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? I think we understand the response. Go in peace. I wish you well. In other words, this is just a complete blow off, isn't it? This kind of response is, you know, is how it ends the discussion. Go in peace. Be warm. Be satisfied. Go in peace. I wish you well. Be warm. Be fed. And in the Greek, this can either be a middle or passive voice because they're both spelled the same way. But if it's middle, then you would translate this something like, uh, you can go do this for yourself. Go get yourself a good meal and find some warm clothes. This is something you can do. If it's passive, then the thrust was, well, let someone else feed you. Let someone else give you clothes. But the point's the same. You who claim to have faith, you're not helping this brother or sister. Now notice this person who understands the need does not give them the things that are necessary for the body. You see, the issue is not that the individual cannot do anything about it. It's just this inoperative faith does not supply the needs of a brother or sister. He refuses to do anything. You read it, and this is the indictment against that person. And this is why James says, what good does it do? What does it profit? So James leaves the rhetorical question hanging, but every one of us can answer this particular question. There is no benefit. There is no profit of all. If you say you're a believer, if you say you have faith, and you let someone like that, you don't intervene and help them. And notice what he says in verse 17. Thus... Also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So James is contrasting a dead faith with a living faith, a professed faith with a possessed faith. That's the contrast. And James' point is just very clear here, isn't it? The claimed faith that has no works is a dead faith. It's a useless faith. There is no profit. It's dead. It's without life. You're looking for a pulse. You're looking for breath. It's just not there. It's dead. Spurgeon refers to this as a fruitless faith. It's outwardly inoperative because it's inwardly dead. So James is not saying we're saved by works. He's just arguing that one who professes that faith without works is a dead faith. It's unproductive faith. Faith that refuses to yield. Faith that refuses to you know, surrender to the claims of Christ. It's, and it's not saving. If our faith does not lead us to holiness in life, then it's of no use whatsoever. That's James' point. Now, that's the complaint leveled against one who professes to have faith. They talk the talk, they're just not walking the walk, right? And so James argues that this kind of faith cannot save. We all agree that a dead faith can't save, right? All right, that's his point. All right. Now notice there in verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith. And I have works. Show me your faith without your works. And I'll show you my faith by my works. So we have this person comes in that just says, makes this statement. Notice this rebuttal here. Show me your faith without works and I'll show you my faith by my works. The word show means to demonstrate, exhibit, to make known, to prove. Faith is something uh, that is, um, faith is something that's invisible, but it becomes visible how? through our works, right? Let me just hold, hold your place here. I want to go back to Romans 1. I just want to show you something here. And, and these kind of statements are all throughout the, the New Testament. In Romans 1.8, Paul says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. Why? That your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. So these believers there in the imperial city their faith has been made known throughout the whole world. Why? Well, because your faith is not invisible. It is made manifest through how you live, how you conduct yourself, through your faithfulness, which is the fruit we're talking about. Okay? All right. So faith becomes visible through our works or through the fruit. 
Otherwise, how do you know it's there? So when you read through what James is saying over here in James 2, he's teaching that faith and works are inseparable. They go together. True faith is the root that produces the fruit by way of works. James is challenging the whole idea that you can have faith without works. Both say they have faith, but only one can really demonstrate it because only one has the fruit to prove it. The other only has claimed faith and nothing to support it. Now he goes on, look at what he says in verse 19. You believe that there is one God? You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Now this is a reference back to Deuteronomy 6. And every Jew would have had believed that creed, right? They would have been able to recite this. They would have recited this every morning. James is asking, do you believe the creed? Do you believe in this information? This is intellectual belief. Now notice what he's saying. He's not saying you believe in. He's saying that you believe that. It's only intellectual. They have an intellectual assent that God is one. He says, you believe the creed that God is one? You're doing well. But before you congratulate yourself, there's a problem. That's no better than the demons. He says even the demons believe this. They shudder. They tremble. And so this is a word that refers to physical signs of terror. Even the demons believe this and tremble in horror. We know that the demons have a knowledge and believe in the existence of God, right? We know that the demons understand the deity of Christ and who he is. We know that they understand something of the judgment to come. In other words, there are no atheists, there are no agnostics among the demons. They have knowledge, they believe facts. That's what James is trying to get them to understand. He's saying, you know, that there are a lot of kinds, a lot of different kinds of faith, but there's only one that saves. The demons have a faith. The demons have a belief system. But it's not salvific. One writes, it is evident that there is faith, and then there's faith. There is nominal faith and there's real faith. There is intellectual faith and heart faith. There is sensual faith and spiritual faith. There is dead faith and vital faith. There is traditional faith and personal faith. There is faith that is orthodox but has no more saving power than the demon's faith. You see, saving faith means far more than just believing God. That's what James is trying to get us to understand. Saving faith is far more than just believing facts about God. The demons believe God. They believe that there's only one God. They're not worried about the God of Islam, are they? They're not worried about the pantheons and, and the millions of gods of Hinduism, are they? They're not worried about any of the false gods that don't exist. They know that one God exists. One writer said it this way, If demons hold such faith and remain in perdition, then men who have such faith will go to perdition. Are we starting to get that point now, what James is saying? Do you see how this ties? We need the fruit of faithfulness. The fruit of faithfulness is the manifestation and demonstration that there is true faith, true saving faith within us. And so we go from verse 19, we get verse 20, but do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? He says, O empty, you foolish, you senseless, you vain man. And so th this word is used typically for men, and it's typically referring to something that's evil. He goes on to say that faith without works is dead, it's ineffective, it's barren, it's unprofitable. It's like money that doesn't gain interest. It's like land that doesn't you know, have any crops. A faith like this is barren, it's empty. Hold your place here, go to Jude. You remember the kind of empty people, the apostates that were infiltrated into the church there uh, when you know, Jews writing to people who let their guard down and let these godless men into the assembly? Notice how he describes them in verse 12. He says, these are spots in your love feast. In other words, they're there. They're fellowshipping with you. They're at the love feast while they feast with you without fear. And they serve only themselves. And notice how he describes them. They're like clouds without water. Can you envision you're there in the desert and it hasn't rained in a long time. And then this cloud comes up. And you're hopeful that there's something there and it doesn't drop any rain. The cloud's useless to you, isn't it? He says, they're like clouds without water, carried about by the winds, laid out on trees without fruit, twice dead. Well, what good is a, a tree without fruit? Raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. I mean, this is the kind of idea we're getting here, right? This is the kind of thrust that we're seeing here. The idea here is, once again, it is a barren faith. It's unprofitable. It's like a cloud without water. It's like a land that bears no crops. No more stunning example of dead faith, one says, has ever been presented. And so when you read through these statements, James makes it clear that saving faith produces work. It's not dead. It's not barren. One of the reformers said it this way, faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is never alone. Turn back over to Galatians 5. 
Now, I hope you realize that each week we're building fruit upon fruit. As you looked upon this fruit of faithfulness, when you read through this and you see here, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. When you read through that and you meditated upon that message that we need the fruit of faithfulness, Jesus kind of shrugged it off. Yeah, we probably need that. I hope this morning you see that the fruit of faithfulness is critical. It is critical. Now, it's interesting when you read some of the commentators. When they come to this, uh, some of them will argue that from the grammar, uh, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. So there's a singular fruit of love, and then the rest of these, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, that's a description of this fruit of love. That's what that fruit of love should look like. So that's interesting. If we are to be a people who are characterized by love, one of the things that we have to have is to be a faithful people. This means that we are people who live based upon principles, not what is at my self-interest at the moment. Do you understand that now? How would it be? I mean, take the example there in James. How does it benefit me to see someone who is cold, without the proper clothing, starving, and I, I, I help them out. How does that benefit me at that moment? I'm just transferring resources from my pot to theirs, right? There is no self-interest in that example, is it? The principles must dictate, even to my own hurt, this person's in need. This person, and I claim to have faith. Does that make sense now? We need to be a faithful people. And we can extrapolate this to all. James just gives you one example, and many of them could, could be there. We need to be a faithful people. So how do we cultivate faithfulness here in this church? Number one, reflect upon God. Turn over to 2 Chronicles 19. 2 Chronicles 19. Second Chronicles 19, look at verse 9. And he commanded them, saying, Thus you shall act in the fear of the Lord faithfully, with a loyal heart. Well, if we're to be a faithful people, uh, if we're going to be faithful in carrying out our duties before God, then we would do well to have a proper fear of Jehovah. Now, if we think about God and reflect on Him, and as we stand in awe of Him, I don't think we would dare be faithless. Right? In other words, if I lived in such a way of the reality that God is ever watching me, I wouldn't have a problem with faithfulness. Go back. Are you the kind of person when the boss is not looking? When you're all by yourself, if you could get away with something, you would. Then what you're basically testifying is that God is not all-knowing. He's not worthy of fear and respect. But he's not there in your presence, understanding. You act as though there's not going to be a judgment where you're going to stand and give an account. It would do, we would do well to reflect upon God and have a proper fear. Do we live in the fear of God? So when we're at work, when we go to the store, do we live in such a way that we are in the presence of God? Do you consider that you're always in the presence of a holy God? The point here is that you live. if you live in awe of God, you will live a faithful life. You don't have to worry about, is my life faithful? If you live in such a way that you live in the fear of God, then you will always live a faithful life. Number two, reflect upon the gospel. Turn over to Titus 2. Titus 2. Look at verse 10. He says, uh, Not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity, that you may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Well, when we are a faithless people, we're, we bring reproach to the gospel. But when, when we live in a way that's faithful before God, we bring credit to the gospel. In other words, what does Paul mean when he says we adorn ourselves with the doctrine of God? Well, you know what it means. You understand the principles, you understand the teachings and the expectations in the scriptures, and you walk in them, right? You are clothed in those doctrines because you live them out. And that's what it means. We need to reflect upon the gospel. We need to adorn the doctrines of God. And when we do this, we manifest ourselves, demonstrate to others that we are a faithful people. Finally, reflect on the return of Christ. Turn over to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Matthew 25, look at verse 21. 
Now, I hope you understand that this is the, about the parable of the, the talents. I'm just jumping in the middle of this. But notice what happens when the, the good master comes back. He says, his Lord, in verse 21, his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful, there it is, servant, you were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Now, this is dealing with the parable of the talents and, and when the master returns, right? The servant knew the master, the good master, was going to come back. You do know Christ is coming back, right? He's coming back. The servant knew that when the master came back, he was going to have to give an account to the master, didn't he? What's the point here? You want to live a faithful life? Notice, what, what is the teaching on the return of Christ? You don't know the signs. You won't know when he's going to return. So what's the point? What does he say? Be ready. Be prepared. Do you live in such a way that you're ready for him? If he came now, you're ready. Are you living that kind of life? You're ready. You're about the Lord's business. You're ready to give an account. We need to always be ready for the Master's return. The Bible says, you know, tells us, we do not know the hour of this return. So be ready. Do we live in such a way? Do you live in such a way that you want the Master to say, well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Do you understand the seriousness of faithfulness now? Well, let's stop here. And Lord willing, go back to Galatians 5. I'm going to try next week. I'm not promising. I'm going to try. I'm going to try next week. I want to see if we can deal with gentleness and self-control. Deal with those two fruits and then kind of bring our study of the, the fruits of the spheres to a close. And get back over to Ephesians 6. Are you beginning to see now that if we're going to be faithful in this warfare that we're in, I hope I've convinced you that, that you're in war. Uh, I hope I've convinced you that it is simple to have a peacetime mentality when there's actual war going on, right? Um, but I hope you're beginning to understand if we are going to be successful on the battlefield, we cannot be characterized by lust of the flesh, but we must be characterized by the fruit of the Spirit. And so we need to just pray once again that Lord would grant us the grace that these fruit would multiply within this assembly, because if not, then what ends up happening? He said, you know, what was the reason? Why is he writing this in verse 15? If you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. And then he says in verse 26, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Once again, there's a problem within this church. They were devouring one another. Why? Because the lust of the flesh were just... And you know what consumes the church? Is when there's this, all this infighting and bite biting and devouring one another. It consumes you. Because now you, you can't be about the business of being out in the community, uh, being out there, being salt and light. So we've got to take these, these warnings seriously. We need to make sure that if we're lacking in any of these fruits, uh, we would pray that the Lord of fruit, the spirit of fruit, would just, once again, work within us, prune those weeds out. Don't be content with the artificial fruit. Want the real thing. And so let's continue to pray for one another that we would be a faithful people, that we would be a people of convictions, and that we're not going to give up these convictions. We're going to be known as a steadfast, stable people who are faithful. Father, gain glory for yourself. Make us a faithful people. Make us a people who manifest this fruit to your glory. May we point to the triumph of grace within our lives. If there's any areas of our life where uh, unfaithfulness we've been guilty of disobedience in any kind of way. Uh, Father, if we've just been content with this artificial fruit that we've talked about, uh, Father, let us just uproot those things, prune them out, get rid of them, so that the true fruit may grow. May we be content with that fruit and that fruit alone. May we only be content with what the Spirit brings. So help us to be humble. Let us examine our own selves uh, as that would be right. Help us to cultivate a, an atmosphere within our own lives so that this fruit of faithfulness might flourish. May we reflect upon you and who you are. May we have a proper fear and respect and adoration of who you are. May we have a proper understanding of the gospel. May we adorn ourselves with the doctrine of God. And may we always live in such a way that we're ready for the good master to come back. That he will always find us about his business. About his kingdom business. May he gain glory for himself. May we be trophies of his grace displayed for all eternity. It's in his name we pray. Amen.